Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Now that we've discussed the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous layer, it's time we talked about some of the exocrine glands of the integumentary system. So first of all, there are two types of glands in the human body. We have endocrine glands and exocrine glands. Endocrine glands release hormones, and we won't generally discuss those until anatomy and physiology too. Endocrine glands also release their secretions, as in hormones, into the bloodstream. Exocrine glands, on the other hand, they release or discharge their secretions onto a body surface. They do not discharge their secretions into the blood. And so, for example, uh, the surface of the skin could be a body surface onto which one of the types of exocrine glands secretes its secretion. All right, so we have three major types of exocrine glands. Let's discuss them in detail. The first kind is called a merocrine sweat gland. So merocrine sweat glands are mostly involved in the function of thermoregulation. That means maintenance of body temperature. So if you were to get too hot, what happens? You sweat. That's something we know happens. If you go outside into the hot summer weather, you might sweat, especially if you get into your car that's been sitting out there for two hours. You'll start sweating because your body gets too hot, and so that sweat helps cool you down. Also, if you start exercising and go for a run or lift weights or whatnot, you'll sweat. That's to cool your body down. That is the function of merocrine sweat glands. So first of all, these glands are the most numerous and widely distributed all over the body, and they're mostly present in thin skin areas. We see that they're going to be simple coiled tubular glands. Right here in my mouse is on the left side of this image. That's a great example of a merocrine sweat gland. Okay. So if we look at its structure, we do see it's a coiled tubular gland, at least in the dermis. And then it has one region that snakes up here through the dermis, through the epidermis. And then we have this whole thing, which is the sweat gland duct, this long tube-like structure. And then we see the sweat pore, and the sweat will then be able to exit onto the surface of the skin. We already know kind of how sweat works, right? Now, with merocrine sweat glands, they're going to produce their secretions via exocytosis, and eventually they'll discharge the secretion, which is sweat, onto the surface of the body. These two things are very important. Know that they produce their secretions by exocytosis and then discharge those secretions onto the surface of the skin. And that secretion is, of course, sweat. Now, sweat is 99% water, but it does have other chemicals in it such as ions, like sodium. This is why your salt, sweat tastes salty, right? It has sodium. It has other metabolites and waste products, such as urea, some uric acid. It has an enzyme called lysozyme, which is able to kill bacteria on the skin surface, prevent them from infiltrating. And then also other things like vitamin C can also be excreted in this way, okay? But merocrine sweat glands are involved in thermoregulation. None of these other sweat glands or glands in general, are involved in thermoregulation. The second kind of exocrine gland that we have is an apocrine sweat gland. Here's an example of one right here. We see it's still a coiled tubular gland, and it's going to, instead of discharging its secretion onto the skin surface, it's actually going to discharge them directly into hair follicles. And generally, most apocrine sweat glands are going to be found in the axillae, those are the armpits, around the nipples, and in the pubic and anal regions, okay? And so what we see here is their secretion is gonna be discharged onto the hair follicle itself. Now, like merocrine sweat glands, they're also gonna produce their secretion via exocytosis. But the way they differ is they don't do it onto the skin surface, apocrine sweat glands do it onto the hair follicle, and then the secretion itself is very different. In the case of merocrine sweat glands, they just make sweat. Apocrine glands make a very different kind of secretion. They produce viscous, cloudy secretions that contain a lot of proteins and lipids. And what happens is, is bacteria on your skin, whenever apocrine sweat glands secrete their secretion, the bacteria are able to act on and metabolize the secretion, and it tends to produce a foul odor. If you wonder why your armpits often stink if you don't wear deodorant, 
it's because the apocrine glands are very numerous in the axillary regions, the armpits. And so your armpits produce this apocrine secretion, and then the bacteria in the vicinity metabolize it and produce that foul smell. Okay? That's why we have to wear deodorant. Okay? So hopefully that gives you something to help you learn it a little bit better. Another thing about apocrine sweat glands is they start producing their secretions normally around puberty. This is why kids don't really stink that much. But once they enter puberty, their apocrine glands become very active and they start uh, stinking okay, in those areas. And the reason for that is apocrine glands have receptors for testosterone. And testosterone levels start to increase substantially during puberty, and so that's what causes apocrine glands to become more active during that time. I will also mention this because it's important. Both mammary glands and ceraminous glands are modified apocrine glands. Okay? They don't have the same functions, but they're a modified form of these. Mammary glands are the glands that actually generate milk for breastfeeding. Obviously, those don't become active until a female, that is, is either pregnant or have been given birth, okay? And then ceraminous glands are the glands in your external acoustic meatus, which is your ear canal, that produce earwax, okay? Again, remember that the secretions of apocrine glands are protein-rich and lipid-rich. That's satisfied by both earwax, protein-rich and lipid-rich, and then also uh, breast milk. So hopefully that makes sense. The third type of exocrine gland is called a sebaceous gland. These are glands that produce an oily substance called sebum. The specific type of gland they belong to is a holocrine gland. This is the class of gland that a sebaceous gland is. And the way holocrine glands work is they generate cells that contain the oil, or the sebum, and those cells eventually rupture and disintegrate, releasing their contents, which happen to be the sebum. Now the way sebaceous glands work, and you can actually see one of them right here actually attached to this hair follicle, sebaceous glands produce this sebum and they discharge it into a hair follicle in a similar way that apocrine sweat glands do, except for the fact that the sebaceous gland is actually attached directly to the hair follicle as you can see right here. There's actually two others right here on the left side, but we're going to look at this one. So they're attached to the hair follicle itself and they discharge the sebum into the hair follicle. Now, the sebum itself is going to lubricate both the hair and the skin, but these glands do not discharge their sebum directly onto the skin surface. Rather, they discharge it into the hair follicle and it moves up onto the surface of the skin. Okay? Now, the sebum itself is going to be bactericidal. So not only does it lubricate the skin and give it a more hydrophobic property to it, but it also kills bacteria. So that's very important because it acts as protection uh, to help prevent pathogen invasion into the underlying tissues. Now sebaceous glands, like apocrine glands, have their activity stimulated by androgens, such as testosterone, and so therefore they're going to become most active during puberty. So during puberty, testosterone levels go up, and so sebaceous glands also have receptors for testosterone, and so testosterone is going to increase the activity of those sebaceous glands, which is why typically when people first enter puberty, that's when they would start seeing oilier skin. That's because of increased activity of these sebaceous glands. So apocrine sweat glands become active during puberty. Uh, they don't produce oily skin, they just produce a bad stench. So that might lead you to the question, well, what's the point of an apocrine sweat gland? This is a little bit beyond the scope of this course, but there's two things. One, they do provide some lubrication to the hair follicle itself, okay, because they are discharging their secretions into the hair follicle. But also, apocrine secretions contain pheromones. So what are pheromones? Pheromones are chemicals that are released out of the body and become airborne and they can be detected by the olfactory system, which is smell, of another organism. So for example, how does a male mouse know when a female mouse is able to become pregnant? Well, when the female mouse is able to become pregnant, she releases pheromones that are picked up by the male mouse. And so those pheromones are released by apocrine sweat glands. So hopefully this makes sense. Hopefully this gave you a good understanding of the three kinds of exocrine glands in the integumentary system. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.